This situation in Delhi, the likes of which I have never seen in my life and I hope to never see again, it's like a war zone, losing someone every 30 minutes. All the crematoria are working overtime. There is a new crematorium with a hundred fires, which is just not too far from here. You know, my own phone is, is constantly with messages about people who need oxygen. Can you get a bed here? Can I get some drugs here? This is not once in a day, it's every two minutes. And we're just unable to help. There are many people who, who are dying. I know of a young couple in their 30s who died leaving behind two orphan children. And literally just before I joined this interview, one of my colleagues at work, uh, one of his nephews, who was only 21 years old, died. And these are absolutely heartbreaking. I mean, at the end of the day, it's a human tragedy which is unfolding at, at a really mass scale in India. And it's, it's utterly depressing. It's mind-numbing. There's a desperate shortage of supply of oxygen in hospitals. Gangaram, which is one of India's best hospitals here in Delhi, essentially lost 25 patients just a few days ago because the oxygen supply ran out. Earlier this afternoon, uh, I had a request from someone who was a very senior bureaucrat till just a few, couple of years ago. Him, his wife, his daughter-in-law and his mother-in-law all in desperate need of oxygen. So this is not something that's available to anybody, rich or poor at this point in time. Extremely difficult to get. It is a last mile connectivity issue, as the government says. India does have a lot of oxygen. At any given time, only 15% of the oxygen is used for medical purposes. The rest goes to industrial purposes. And India is now diverting all of that oxygen for medical purposes. But it's just not in the places where people are. And you could be sitting in one place and there could be an oxygen plant just 50 yards from you. But if there's no way to get to you, then, you know, you're out of luck. One of the challenges which, uh, you know, is very apparent is that a lot of people are also hoarding oxygen. They're getting a cylinder just in case something happens. And therefore, there's also an artificial shortage caused by that. So what we've done is rope in a bunch of companies that have specialization in procurement and logistics in being able to operate on the ground and connections to hospitals and being able to secure medical oxygen supplies and brought all of these folks together in just four days. We're trying to bring the best of the private sector and capabilities to being able to solve this last mile connectivity problem. What can those of us who are not in India and see what's happening do? You know, uh, I think all help is, is welcome. Uh, I think at this stage, we just need to be able to get the concentrators and the cylinders. They're all in short supply. The situation in Delhi, it brings out both the best and the worst in people. The worst in people is, you know, people needing, wanting stuff, even though they are not absolutely in desperate need. Wanting a hospital bed when their oxygen just drops from 92, and I have people at oxygen levels of 62 who need a bed and trying to throw their weight around and their privilege. And that's the worst of humanity. But the best of humanity is that so many people have chipped in to help. Volunteers, people you know, running websites, trying to, uh, to operate on the ground despite the enormous risk to themselves. It's time for a powerful show of humanity because at the end of the day, we're going to lose lives to this pandemic here in other places as well. But if we can survive with our humanity intact, then we would have learned something for the next crisis. The B1617 and the B1618, which are uh, the so-called Indian variants, are not scientifically linked to increased transmissibility or lethality. But that said, the clinical presentation of the disease in the second wave seems markedly different. I had not really heard of any 21-year-olds die or 30-year-olds die in the first round. There were, but not, you know, anecdotally, uh, and also talking to people on the ground, it seems as if we're facing quite a different situation. So something is changing in these strains for sure. And also we had evidence that breakthrough strains against the AstraZeneca vaccine were negligible based on data which are a couple of months old, but I'm not so sure anymore. I'm, we're seeing anecdotally again, not data-based, people who've been fully vaccinated, both doses, you know, I know of a doctor who died after getting both doses and then got a COVID infection. So this is going to be a changing enemy and that's how it works. Would you say that to other people that no matter what, you should still get the vaccination, even though there's still the possibility you could get uh, COVID-19 even after the vaccination? 100%. I would say to people around the world, please get vaccinated. That's really the only way in which you're going to get out of the pandemic. If you haven't been vaccinated, the risk of COVID, which is a terrible disease. I've seen people die terrible deaths in the last year, but certainly in the last two weeks, it's not a good way to go. And your side effects of the vaccine or your risk with the vaccine 
are infinitely smaller. So please get vaccinated. The main challenge for vaccination is not hesitancy because everyone now wants a vaccine. It's really a supply issue. Unfortunately, India did not invest the same way that other countries did in procuring its vaccine supply. And therefore, there's a huge shortage. India produces about two and a half million doses a day. But even if it's vaccinating at two and a half or three million doses a day, it will take almost another two years to get all the necessary people vaccinated. So uh, the vaccination production needs to ramp up to five or six times where it is right now. The central government is basically now punted to all the state governments to procure their own vaccines, something which is unimaginable, never been done in India for vaccines before. India always produces, procures its vaccines at a central level. And what that may end up doing is inducing a competition between states to procure vaccines, in which case the wealthier states, which are all in the south, may end up getting more vaccines than the states in the north.